Probably shouldn't stand in front of that camera. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So, uh, well, it's always very polite to thank organizers, but uh, I definitely would like to say a bit more than just what is the basic way to say thanks to the organizer. Uh, well, being at the, almost at the end of the, of the conference, we can see that it was absolutely successful and I'm very, very happy that I was invited here. And I'm really thankful to the efforts that have been made, especially with the two organizers with whom I have been in contact, who are uh, Frank Garvan and uh, Mrs. Summers. So thanks very much to them. Okay, I say a few words for you after the mathematics. Let us move to uh, sunlight conjecture. So, uh, we'll have to, to start with uh, Chola's conjecture. Uh, Chola's conjecture uh, says something that uh, there is some orthogonality between the different values of the mu function. If you take different powers, uh, well, indeed, a, i are non-negative uh, integers, but essentially the values which are of interest are 0, 1, and 2. Then it will, it will repeat. For 0, it means simply that Zero, anything to power zero is one, this convention. So for example, if you start by uh, taking a zero is equal to one, a one is equal to zero, and a two is equal to one, you have just the sum of mu of n and mu of n plus two, and uh, the fact that you have something which is correlate then would be, according to what uh, Harold Diamond was saying, some sort of a weak version of a strong prime twin conjecture. The strong prime twin conjecture <coughs> is that you have the equivalent of the number of that, and this would be a bit weaker than, uh, than the twin prime conjecture. So we are very far from knowing anything like that. Of course, you need one of the integers to be odd, otherwise you have only positive elements, and you cannot expect anything like that. Well. We, we don't know anything, uh, at least I don't know anything about, uh, about this conjecture. Uh, and uh, Sarnak uh, formulated a conjecture which is indeed a consequence of uh, Chola's conjecture, this he proved, that it is a consequence of Chola's conjecture, and it says the following, that any sequence which is produced in some way by a deterministic flow is orthogonal to the modulus function. So I think essentially, I will devote some time just to explain what are the different words here. And in the title, you have seen also something about automatic sequence. So this means that the, the dynamical system we are going to study are the dynamical system associated to automatic sequence. So let us start by translating Sonnet's conjecture when the dynamical system is produced by a sequence. We start with this. OK. So first, uh, we have a finite. It's okay. Yeah, we have a finite set, uh, omega, and on the sequences, well, n for me means is the original Bourbaki one. You have a zero in it for the time being. It's not that important. If you are dealing with automatic sequence, it's very convenient to have zero in it. So write it the way you like, or add a zero, or write it the way you wish. But anyhow, yeah, this is integers. Okay, and when you have a, a sequence of element uh, in the finite set, even if it is not finite, uh, you have a shift operator, which is just, you see, you translate all the, all the elements, instead of starting and looking at a0, a1, a2, and so on, you look at a1, a2, and so on. Uh, well, you can equip omega n with its natural topology. What does it mean? That two sequences are closed when there are a few first terms which are equal, and they're even closer when you have more terms which are equal. And uh, it is a very nice topology. You can define it with a matrix and uh, so it's something very, very easy. And uh, the shift is, uh, is continuous, of course, if you have two sequences which are rather close, that is to say which coincide on the k first element, then if you shift them, they will at least coincide on the k minus one first element. So it's a bit, a bit apart, but however, 
it is continuous. Okay, so to a sequence A, we associate the dynamical system, which is done in the following way. You look at all the translate of your sequence A, or the shift of the, of the sequence A, and uh, you take the closure in the, in the space of the, of the sequences, and uh, this is stable by T, by the shift. This is very easy to see. And the flow associated to an element X, which is in XA, is simply the following, that you associate to an integer the nth shift, iterative shift of X itself. Okay? And uh, to observe, you, you remember what was, uh, what was here in the, what was it here? Hmm? So we have a sequence observing a deterministic flow. So now we know what is a flow, and to observe it is simply to have a function, a continuous function, on your set XA, and uh, which, uh, uh, which is continuous with value in C, and so this will be the sequence psi of n, which is f of tn of x. Okay? And now to say that it is orthogonal to the Möbius function simply means that if you take the, uh, how you say, the, 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 the twisted uh, sum of, uh, of psi by the mu function, then you have something which is essentially a little n. Okay. So this would be the, so we know almost everything. Uh, what we, what we need to know is indeed uh, what it means, especially in this case. You see, the problem is that we are starting with any element x in the neighborhood of Tn of A. So it should be possible to understand only with the sequence A itself what it means and what you have to prove to get the, to, to prove the, the, the Sarnax conjecture. So this is just a technical, uh, technical uh, proposition which tells you the following, that when you take a sequence A with values in a finite set omega, as usual, and uh, you suppose that for any J, which is at least one, and every function, which is continuous, some omega J, and every L, then if you look at the sum of the blocks of length J, you are looking at the sum of the J, this is orthogonal to mu, <coughs> And the point to, you have to add is that it is uniform in L. This is an important point in the system. So this is exactly in some way, we can start by that and say what we want to prove is that if we have this kind of sequence, which is nice, to prove in some way some conjecture, is just to prove this orthogonality. So technically, we are back to, to something which we, we all understand here. Okay. So now the question is to know what is a deterministic system. So, you see when you are looking at all the blocks of length j, then the number of possible blocks is something which is the cardinal of omega to power j. Okay? So it is something, the number of blocks is something which is essentially exponential in j, and to say that it is deterministic in our case will be for a dynamical system corresponding to a sequence, it means simply that the number of blocks is sub-exponential. Uh, okay. So I would like to, to take some example, which is the, the, the <coughs> what has been shown by um, James Maynard. Uh, it is to consider the set of integers having no seven in the decimal expansion. Okay, and we consider the sequence, which is the indicator of this function. We will we'll say a bit more about this sequence, but just so an is 1, if n has no 7 in its decimal expansion, then an is 0 otherwise. So just to, I'm not going to, to prove it, so it's not that difficult to prove that the complexity is sub-exponential if you take blocks, but just to tell you, for example, that some blocks cannot, cannot occur in this sequence. Uh, you can see, for example, that an, an plus 1, n plus 2, n plus 3 cannot be 1, 0, 0, 1. So you have some blocks that are not in. And indeed, there are many blocks which are not in, and this will mean that it is sub-exponential. Why is it so? You see, you say that an is in your sequence. So an has no 7. Now you say that the next one has 0. So you produce a 7. Now you have 
two, one way to produce a seven is simply because your word is ending with a six. So you add a one, you have a seven. But if you produce a six that way, then the next one will be a good guy. So it means that if you have one zero zero, you don't produce the seven at the last word. It means that there will be some carryover to produce, uh, for example, that your word was ending with 69 or 6999 or something like that. And then you add a one and you find a bad guy. Here you are. But now you know that there will be several bad guys after that. Because you end with a zero and here you end with the one and here you end with a two and even you have even much larger block. So this is the in some way why you have for this sequence. Uh, some complexity. Okay, I think now we have about said everything. Any sequence observing a deterministic flow is orthogonal to the Möbius function. I think we understand what it is. Uh, what I have to add now is what is automatic sequence. Okay? <coughs> so let us say what is an automatic sequence. So definitely this sequence is some automatic sequence. It is produced in the following way. You read the expansion in the base 10, and you can read the digit one after the other. And you are in some way in two, here in two states. States are you are you have a bad guy or you have a good guy. So a priori, when you start, you are with a good guy. Say. And now you are reading the digits, one after the other. And when you read the digit, you will go from one state to the other, or to itself. And if you as long as you read something which is different from the seven, you stay and you go on and you say this is a good guy. Now, if you go to something which is you read a seven, ah, this is a bad guy. You go to another state, and now whatever you read, you don't care. It will stay a bad guy. Okay? So this is a sort of generalization of this, which is an automatic sequence. So, okay. So, we have the following. Well, you can produce a, a formal definition, but uh, it's just to understand what it is. B is a basis, a base, like 10, for example, in our example. A B automaton is a finite machine with finite in many states. And essentially, you have, so you have some initial state. You start with some state which is given. And uh, then, each time you are reading some element which is in B, you a digit somewhere, you go to another state. I mean another, it can be the same one, of course, but you go to another state. So this is the in some way the dynamic of your uh, of your uh, automatic uh, of your automata. And what does the automaton do? Uh, so for an integer n written uh, in base B. So epsilon k, epsilon k minus 1. You may ask whether it is proper representation or improper. This has absolutely no importance. Uh, proper and improper representation, then the automaton starts from the state omega, and successively you read. So here we read from the left. Again, you can say, what if we read from the right? And it is the same thing to read from the left and to read from the right. And so if you read from the left, you are reading delta of epsilon k omega 0. This is a new state, and then you read the next digit, and so on. So you see, with this, by the way, I, I want to advertise a, a book, and uh, I'm very happy that it, one of the authors is here. Uh, you have a Bible for automatic uh, sequences, which is called Automatic Sequences, simply. And uh, it is a very thick and very nice book, which, is, which was written 10 years ago, but which is very, very useful by Jean-Paul Alouche and uh, uh, Jeffrey Shani. <coughs> okay, so, uh, so, for example, you see, you can count that way, uh, for example, the parity of the, do, do, you, do you see in a sequence, if you did, the, the two more sequence would be the following. You read a, a number in base two, and you are asking whether you have an even or odd number of ones. This can be produced by a finite automaton. You start by saying nothing. Once you read a one, you change the parity. And if you read a zero, you don't care. This is also a very simple 
thing. The routine Shapiro sequence, or Shapiro sequence, that has been mentioned already, is also produced by some other method. If we count the number of points in base 2, you have blocks 1-1. One, one. Okay, this has been uh, extensively studied by, uh, by Cobham in the, in the 90s, and, for example, it is known that automatic sequences are uh, deterministic. Indeed, the, the, the complexity is very low, polynomial and linear. Okay. So, where I am? Where I am? I'm here. So now we know what is what is a deterministic sequence. And uh, po, 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 here it is. I should have something here that for deterministic sequences, it has been, it is known in a certain number of cases. I'm just thinking here of automatic sequences. We have to, of course, we have a, a, a large literature about that. It's a very active field. But as regards automatic sequences, essentially, it has been proved by Cecil Dartige and Gerald Tenbo that uh, it is true for the two more sequence. And it has been proved by Tao that it is true for the Rudin Shapiro sequence. So what I would like to, to say is just a, a few words about, uh, about this is uh, theorem by, uh, so you, you have seen on the, on the first, um, on the first uh, <coughs> sheet that uh, there were two other names that were mentioned, uh, Mikhail Dormota. So Mikhail Dormota is in TU Wien uh, in Vienna. And uh, Clemens Müller is a student of uh, PhD student of uh, Michael Dormota. So what we prove is that for a certain class of uh, automaton, then Sarnak's conjecture is true, is valid. So this is uh, synchronizing means that you have at least one word which will lead you to the same. I mean, the word that is to say, the delta function, you remember you say when you read a digit, you go from one state to the other. You can extend that by saying that you are reading a word by just repeating. So when you read one word, then you will go always, whatever you start with, you are going to the same state. Essentially, if you think of the James Maynard sequence, seven is, the letter seven is a word of length one, seven is synchronizing word. Because as soon as you read the seven, whatever you start with, you go to the, to the state, which is the state of bad guys. But in any case, you go to the same state. And it's not difficult to see that as soon as you have a word which is synchronizing, any word which contains this word is also synchronizing. You start at the beginning, you go everywhere you don't care, and then you read the synchronizing word. You know exactly where you are. And when you read the other digit, you have no choice. So as soon as you have one synchronizing word, synchronizing word, you have a bunch of words which are synchronizing. So uh, indeed, it turns out that uh, it seems very specific, but it turns out that in a certain way, almost all automata are synchronizing. I mean, almost all that doesn't mean too much in the way that uh, you can see everything is finite, so it means that it is countable. The number of the automata you can automata you can produce is countable. Uh, that means that if you make some scaling of the complexity concerning the number of states, for example, then the more states you have, the denser you are with synchronizing automata. That's what, uh, what it would mean. Okay. So this is for the mu function, and you may ask also something about what about the prime numbers and about prime numbers. So we have also the, the following thing, that uh, if A is a, again, a synchronizing automaton, then if you count the number of primes up to N for which A of P is going to produce to N of the same word, then this number has a, has a density. And uh, the same way also if you look at uh, polynomial values and things like that. OK? Uh, well. However, it turns out that this was what I announced and put in the, the summary, but this is completely obsolete. And, uh, <laughs> and indeed, uh, Clemens Müller 
put on archive a few weeks ago the complete truth that Sarnat conjecture holds for all automatic sequences. Okay, which is which is a very nice, uh, very nice result. So I don't think I'm going to to, to give you uh, something as proof because in on some way this is this is quite complicated proof, much complicated than the one for synchronizing. And for synchronizing, you may understand. I can say I can say just two words and uh, wait and uh, it's not uh, it's not that complicated. You see, essentially. Since you have, as soon as a word <coughs> contains your synchronizing word, the minimal one, somewhere, then it is also synchronizing. So you have a lot of words which are synchronizing. So it's very bad luck not to find something which is synchronizing. That is to say that if you take almost all the integers, they will end with something which is synchronizing. Good. So they end with something which is synchronizing, so it means that up to something which is not very important, essentially we are dealing only with arithmetic progression. This is true, but for one value, but then you have to remember that we are taking care of different values, so you have also to take care what happens for the very last one, because we are dealing with different digits, you see, we are looking at the function j of a n plus l, a n plus 1 plus l, a n plus 2 plus l, and so on. So you have, first of all, this n plus 1, and also you have this uniformity in L. So there is some little work to, to be done, but essentially you have to... What, what is behind is simply the fact that the Möbius function is orthogonal to all arithmetic progression. And indeed, if you replace it, mu by any function which is orthogonal to arithmetic progression, on synchronizing automaton, you will get the same thing. Now, as we got this result, you have to be cautious when you go to prime. Because it turned out that for automatic, for synchronizing sequences, which are produced, each time you are looking at the set of, what we call the fiber, the set of n for which the automaton produced a given value, this has always a density. This is not true for all automaton. Think, for example, of the integer which start with a 7 in base 10. They don't have a density. They have a lower, upper density, but they don't have really a density. So, of course, you understand also that saying that what you can say about the prime numbers, we start with a 7, this is not something very complicated. Simply the prime number theorem will tell you exactly what is going on, but you see that you, you cannot write it as being a density, so you have to be a bit cautious about that. So, I think I, I'm going to, to, to stop here with this, uh, with this but... Uh, I would like to, to, say, to say two words to, to, to Krishna. Uh, first of all, that well, we, have, we have a two... Ha, 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 you got it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. So, uh, we, we wanted to, to, to say two things. First of all, that uh, Krishna introduced me among, among the, the different things that I owe to, to Krishna. One is about uh, uh, knowledge of some kind of arithmetic function. If you remember the one where, when you are knowing what, the, what is the value when you are just looking at small divisors and, uh, and this kind of thing. So this was very important in connection with my, what my student uh, Bernard Landreau was, uh, was studying. So really this, uh, this knowledge of, uh, of arithmetic function is really invaluable. And, uh, and also a very important point is that uh, Krishna definitely helped me and mentored my first visit to India. And this is very important because I think the, the, first, the first visit in a, in a country, a complicated country in some way, like, like India, determines the fact that you like India or not. And I'm just in love with India. And uh, I go, uh, if, I, if I didn't go 30 times, it, uh, I, never went, I never went there. So, and uh, finally, you, you understand what I was going to say, that maybe you are not going to understand it, but at least everybody will understand what I mean. Uh, 